he started his life. You have this on the right now. This is live. right behind the camera on those two chairs in that okay. camera in the, okay. I don't okay. want anybody knocking the camera Got it. Okay. Was it? I just want to make it right now so it doesn't chill and I'm going to have it. 
literature and oh. also uh, hermeneutics yeah. for this, this term, so eight weeks, and then in eight weeks I'll pick up three more classes. So that's good to Well, I think we should get started. Let's take our seats. I hope everyone got the little half sheet handout that was being handed out at the door uh, to give you an idea of what this is all about. Uh, this little half sheet here presents the purpose of this course and the uh, anticipated lectures that we're going to be dealing with. So welcome to Friday Night Academy. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Christ Reformed Church in Anaheim uh, may have heard of this idea before. Uh, for many years, Dr. Kim Riddlebarger and others were teaching Friday Night Academies uh, down in Anaheim. And so I have shamelessly borrowed that idea from them. And we're trying to uh, do something similar here in Santa Clarita. So uh, welcome to Friday Night Academy, which is sponsored by our church, by Santa Clarita United Reformed Church. So glad you could be here. Uh, 
and we're looking forward to digging into God's Word together. Uh, just some housekeeping things before we get started. So uh, there will be opportunity for questions for Q&A, but not just spontaneously whenever a thought comes into your head. So there will be a moment, maybe halfway through, where I will ask, are there any questions? And then you can just, uh, right from your seat, you can ask your question, and I will try to briefly summarize your question and then give, the, uh, give my answer to it. So the, about halfway through, we'll do a brief, maybe 10 minute uh, Q&A, and then at the end, uh, there'll be a, another opportunity for, uh, again, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of questions at the very end. However, you should be aware that we are recording this. It's being live streamed on YouTube, and it will be on YouTube. So if you don't want your face and your voice to be online, then don't ask a question. You can ask me afterwards. So just be aware of that. Um, in this day and age, you know, people are kind of getting more and more comfortable with the idea that there's a lot less privacy in life, <laughs> but still, some may be concerned, so just be aware of that. Uh, you can see the two cameras we have here. This camera is recording me, and then there's a camera in the corner there that is recording the audience. Uh, that will be turned on at the moment of the Q&A. It's not going on, that camera is not on all the time. Uh, but when the Q&A happens, the audience will be on the video. So the topic of this course is covenant theology. The purpose of this course, I'm reading here from the handout, the purpose of this course is to provide a thorough understanding of Reformed covenant theology. The course will cover the topic of covenant theology from three broad perspectives. Systematic theology, biblical theology, and practical theology. I know you might be wondering, what is the difference between systematic theology and biblical theology? I'll explain that later in this lecture. But uh, biblical theology is related to systematic theology, but it is not exactly the same thing as systematic theology. So we're going to be looking at this topic of covenant theology from these three angles. Uh, the angle of systematic theology will be the the first uh, few lectures. So today's lecture is introducing the topic, but then beginning next week, lectures two, three, and four will be on the systematic approach to covenant theology in which we look at the three theological covenants. The covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace. And that's the systematic approach to the topic of covenant theology. Then after we do that, then lectures five through nine will be on biblical theology, the biblical theological approach to the biblical covenants. There is no verse in there in the Bible where it says, and now God made the covenant of grace. But there are verses that say, now God made the covenant with Abraham, or God made the covenant with Moses, and so on, or with Israel. Those are the biblical covenants. And they're related to those theological covenants, but those are the biblical covenants, and that's when we'll be tracing biblical theology and showing how those connect to the big theological covenants, the big three. And then we'll conclude lectures 10, 11, and 12 with practical theology. How does covenant theology illuminate the gospel? How does covenant theology help us in the Christian life? How we are we to relate to God? And, um, to be, how is our obedience supposed to fit into our relationship with God in the covenant of grace? And then the last lecture, lecture 12, will be on covenant theology and the sacraments. So if you were coming to this whole class because you wanted to know what is the Reformed position on baptism, <laughs> and that's like your main thing you're interested in, you're going to have to wait because we're not going to get to that till the very end. Uh, although I will mention it tonight briefly uh, in, when I'm introducing the topic. Uh, because covenant theology isn't just about the sacraments. It isn't just about our view of baptism. It's a much bigger thing. It's really trying to understand the whole Bible, trying to understand how the whole Bible fits together. And so that's really what we want to focus on, is that big picture of how does the Bible unfold from Genesis to Revelation? How is it structured through these various covenants? Uh, 
So that's the basic outline. You'll notice there in the schedule that uh, March 29th is Good Friday. So we won't be meeting that night because many of you will be attending uh, Good Friday services at your churches. So we'll skip that night, but then we'll come back April 5th for the 11th lecture and April 12th is the final lecture. The plan is to go on break for the summer and then hopefully, Lord willing, if God uh, allows, we will try to do this again in the fall and do another 12 week uh, course not sure yet exactly what the topic will be. I have some ideas. Maybe you can share with me if you have something that you're really interested in. Um, we'll do another uh, course on uh, understanding some area of the Bible or maybe systematic theology. Um, we'll see. Also note that uh, I've mentioned there at the very bottom of the half sheet that there is one book that I would encourage you to read if you desire. You don't have to read this book. It's not like a regular class where you have to read the textbook. But if you want some additional reading that will complement these lectures, I would recommend this book by Michael Brown and Zach Keel titled Sacred Bond, Covenant Theology Explored. I have here the first edition. The second edition um, is, has a different cover, but I recommend the second edition. You can get it from Reformed Fellowship, and I've given you the website there. You can also get it um, not only in hard copy, but you can get a um, uh, Kindle version as well, if you would like. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Bow with me. Lord, we thank you so much for this time you've given us to dig into your word and to study this wonderful topic of covenant theology. We pray that you would be with us tonight, uh, soften our hearts, and make us receptive to hear what you have to say for us in your word. And may we rejoice in the glories of your amazing covenant of grace that you have made beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden after the fall and continuing all the way down to the present day, that eternal covenant of grace. We long for the day when we see it fulfilled in the new creation. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So I want to start off by just simply talking about the importance of covenants in the Bible. Um, if you have read the Bible, many of you have, uh, you will note that covenants are referred to all the time in the Bible. Covenants are very important. The Hebrew word for covenant, uh, which is barit, occurs 284 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the word covenant also occurs. It's a different word. It's the word diatheke in Greek. It occurs 33 times. And so it's more than 300 times. 300 and do the math there. Uh, it's, it's a lot. It's, it occurs quite a bit in the Bible. It is a very important theme. Uh, just to make one little note there, Sometimes you will hear covenant terminology being used in Latin because systematic theologians like to use Latin words for things. So sometimes you'll hear a phrase like the pactum salutis. You ever heard that term? Yeah, some of you have heard of it. That just means, that's just using the Latin word pactum, which is the Latin translation for covenant. And then salutis means of salvation or of redemption. So the pactum salutis is that second covenant that I mentioned, the, th the three theological covenants, the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, that's also called the pactum salutis, and the covenant of grace. Another term you'll sometimes hear, this one may be a little bit less frequent, uh, is the Latin word foedus. Foedus, it's spelled F-O-E-D-U-S, and it's where we get the English word federal from, like the federal government is uh, supposed to be this idea of the states being federated together in a covenant, right? So the idea of foetus is another translation that the Latin, um, the, the Latin translation of the Bible uses. Uh, the Vulgate is the Latin translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sometimes uses the word foetus. Um, and that's why sometimes covenant theology is referred to as, anybody heard this one? Federal 
theology because it's, that's just using the Latin word for covenant. Federal theology is the same thing as covenant theology. But you'll sometimes hear that term as well. And then lastly, there's another Latin word that you'll, you do know. This is very well known, and that is the word testamentum or testament. Even our Bible is called the Old Testament and the New Testament, meaning the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So these are three different Latin words that you sometimes hear uh, to refer to a covenant. So the word covenant is found all over the place in the Bible. It's so important. Uh, it's just on page after page. Uh, it's even used even in less theological context. Like there are times where uh, you'll hear about a covenant being made between two individuals that doesn't have anything to do with the great plan of redemption or the covenant of grace or anything that God is doing theologically, or at least it doesn't appear on the surface. For example, uh, why don't you go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you brought them, to Genesis chapter 21. Here's an example of a covenant that's very pedestrian, very just ordinary covenant, just uh, Abraham and this guy named Abimelech. Abimelech was um, a Philistine who lived in the land of Canaan. Uh, this is the time of Abraham's uh, sojourning in the land. And uh, it says in Genesis 21, verse 22, that at that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. Now, so far, the word covenant has, been, has not been used. Instead, it's this verb to swear, swear to me, I will swear. But the word covenant will come up in a minute. Verse 25, when Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, so you can imagine, you know, Abraham's a very wealthy man. He has huge flocks and herds, and he needs to have place to pasture. He needs to have wells of water. But Abimelech, the Philistine, and the people of the Canaanites who are in the land, they're also doing the same thing with their flocks and their lands. And so they came into conflict with each other over the wells. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. That is the word covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart, and Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Bir Sheva, because there, both of them swore an oath. Bir Sheva, Sheva means well of the oath. Sheva means oath. Because there, both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Bir Sheva. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beer Sheva and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Later on, when you know, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has his sons, and they become a great nation. Later on, the nation of Israel, they will come back to the land and God is going to tell them, you cannot make covenants with the inhabitants of the land, with the Canaanites. You shall not make covenants with them. But at this point in time, the land is not yet given to Abraham's descendants in that full sense of possessing it and dwelling in it as this special holy land. At this time, it's a place of sojourning. It's a place where Abraham and his Children are descendant, they are sojourners in the land. They're temporary residents. And so they are allowed to make covenants. They are allowed to make treaties with the inhabitants of the land. But later on, they won't be able to. And later on, they will be sent in by God to wipe out the Canaanites, to bring about God's judgment upon them. 
But this passage is interesting because what does it tell you? It tells you, first of all, that the concept of a covenant and covenant making is actually a very human, ordinary thing. Yes, it does have theological significance, but it's that God is taking something from the human realm and using it as an analogy to help us understand our relationship with him. The second thing we understand about this passage here that brings out the meaning of covenant is that we see how it's interchangeable with the idea of swearing an oath. Starts off using the word swear to me, swear to me, verse 22, 23, 24. Then it says in verse 27, they made a covenant. Then it switches back to verse 31, he called the place Be'er Shiva because both of them there swore an oath. And then it switches back to covenant in verse 32, so they made a covenant. So swear, swear, covenant, swear, covenant. <laughs> So it tells you that those two concepts are very closely related. They're not exactly interchangeable, but they're very closely related. In fact, what this is telling you is that this is the way in which covenants are made. They're made by swearing an oath. Here's a very ordinary human treaty or covenant that's made between Abraham and Abimelech, but there are other examples in the Bible where the same language of swearing an oath and making a covenant are used in a theological covenant, in a theological context. Uh, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, Deuteronomy 29, this is the renewal of the covenant uh, with Israel at Moab, in the land of Moab. The initial covenant was made at Horeb, which is a, another name for Mount Sinai. That was back in Exodus. But then after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses is about to die. And before he dies and hands everything over to Joshua, he renews the covenant at Moab or in Moab on the other side of the Jordan before they go in to the land. And it says there in Deuteronomy 29, verse 1, these are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb that is at Sinai 40 years earlier. And then Moses summons all the people. He reminds them of what God has done, how he brought them out of the land of Egypt with great signs and wonders, how he led them in the wilderness for 40 years. He provided for them, their clothes didn't wear out, and so on. And then he says, therefore, verse nine, therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. And then he says, you're all standing here today all the heads of your tribes, the elders, the officers, the little ones, the wives, the sojourners, they're all here. Why? Verse 12. So Deuteronomy 29, verse 12 says, you're here so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today. Now that's the ESV. The ESV says the sworn covenant. So you see both ideas, right? Swearing an oath and covenant just kind of combined together into one phrase. In the New American Standard Version, it actually splits those two things up because it says this. It says that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today. The covenant and his oath. But those are not two separate things, like as if there's the covenant here and there's the oath over there. It's one thing. That's why the ESV translated as the sworn covenant, the oath-bound covenant, the covenant that was made by an oath, so that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God, and so on. And then it keeps using that phrase throughout. Verse 14, this sworn covenant. Verse 19, this sworn covenant. Verse 21, in accordance with all the curses of the covenant, and so on. So you see how covenant and swearing an oath are very closely tied together in uh, biblical theology, not just in the example of Abraham and Abimelech in a very earthly level, but also in this theological covenant between God and Israel. It is a covenant that is also an oath, and it's by means of the oath and swearing the oath that the covenant is being transacted. Right here, they're at this, they're at this second, they're at this covenant renewal ceremony 40 years later, and God is saying, he's gathering all the people, summon all, the, all the, the heads of the tribes, everybody together, because now we're gonna do this formal ceremony of entering into this covenant, renewing this covenant, and taking this oath to be God's people 
Uh, also, we see the same thing in reference to the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is also an oath that God swears. He says, by myself I have sworn. God is making an oath to Abraham. And you see that very clearly if you want to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 72 and 73. This is the prophecy of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And he is rejoicing in what he is seeing taking place right here in his life through the birth of his son, John the Baptist, whom he knows is the forerunner of the Messiah. And he says, you know, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has redeemed his people and so on. And he's doing this, why? Verse 72, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. So here, the word oath and the word covenant are almost synonymous. They're not exactly synonymous, but they're very closely related. His holy covenant is the same thing as the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. In other words, what, John, what Zechariah is saying is that he is witnessing through these events that are taking place right there in his life, he's witnessing that the reality that God is fulfilling his promises that he made to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob and so on. So this is a very helpful observation. When we see the close connection between covenant making and swearing an oath, this helps us to define a covenant. We can get a clear understanding of what a covenant is when we observe this close connection between the covenant and the oath. Meredith Klein uses this definition. I like it because unlike most of his other writings, it's really short. <laughs> most of Klein's writings are really long and complicated and hard to understand. Here he gives us a really nice nutshell definition of a covenant. Ready? Oath-bound commitment. That's what a covenant is. It's an oath-bound commitment. It's when someone makes a commitment to someone else and makes that commitment binding by an oath. So just think about these two aspects of the definition of a covenant, oath-bound and commitment. So we'll look at commitment first. What is a commitment? It's a promise. It's saying, I promise to do so and so. Going back to the example of Abraham and Abimelech, in Genesis 21, what are they promising to do? They're promising, Abraham is promising he's not going to uh, interfere with Abimelech's flocks and their wells, and they're gonna keep a distance between themselves. And uh, you know, Abimelech saw how God was blessing Abraham with wealth and with flocks and herds, and he was a little bit afraid that maybe he's gonna take over, right? So they're making an agreement. We're not gonna fight each other. We're gonna just go our separate ways and not interfere with each other's wells and flocks and herds. So it's a commitment. I'm promising to do this, promising to do X. That's what a commitment is. Now we do have to be careful here. Uh, I used this word promise just a second ago as a synonym for a commitment, but we have to be careful because not all commitments are promises. Paul, for example, in the book of Galatians and also in Romans, uh, he makes a big deal out of the fact that when God made his covenant with Abraham, that covenant had the character of a promise, which is a guaranteed blessing that is received only by faith. But not all commitments are promises. Some commitments are a different kind of commitment where you're committing yourself to be obedient to God, right? For example, in the passage we were just looking at in Deuteronomy 29, where they're renewing the covenant at in Moab, after 40 years after the initial covenant at Sinai, what is the commitment that they're promising to do there? It's not that they're promising to bless God, it's they're promising to obey God, they're promising to keep the law. So commitment is a broad term, I'm using that term, Klein uses that term as a broad category that covers all different types of, of commitments, a commitment to do God's will, to be obedient, a commitment to bless someone, it can be anything. It's a, it's a broad category. So don't just equate commitment with promise. In our terms, we think of promise as something that's utterly gracious. Where you're just promising to do something uh, and blessing someone else. But it doesn't always have to be that. It's an oath-bound commitment. The nature of the commitment can vary depending on the, the covenant. 
So it's a commitment. I will do X, whether it's God promising to bless Abraham or whether it's Israel promising to obey God. It's a commitment, but then it's an oath-bound commitment. It's a commitment that has an oath attached to it. And what does that do to the commitment? It makes the commitment binding. And now there's going to be some consequences if you don't do it, right? By making an oath, there's going to be consequences if you don't keep your word, if you don't follow through on your commitments. An oath typically has this type of uh, quality to it. You see this throughout the Old Testament, where somebody will say, may God do to me and more so besides if I fail to do X or Y or Z. In other words, may God take my life, right? It's a, it's a curse. You're pronouncing a hypothetical curse upon yourself and saying, if I don't do this, then may God judge me. So it's an oath-bound commitment. I'm going to do this, and may I be accursed if I don't do it. So that's the essence of a covenant. Now, there are two major types of covenants in the Bible. If God is the one who's taking the oath, where he's saying, may I become a curse if I fail to fulfill my promise, that makes it a promise covenant. But if man is the one that takes the oath, then it makes it a law covenant. In a promise covenant, God is placing his own self on the line. He's saying, may I become a curse if I fail to keep my word. And so when God takes the curse on himself, or at least hypothetically, then that means that it's a guaranteed blessing. If God takes the oath, if he swears by himself, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, that language is used throughout the Old Testament in reference to the Abrahamic covenant, when he does that, that means that the blessings are guaranteed for man. God takes the curse on himself, and so for man, that means only blessings. And the only response that we could have to that when God makes that kind of a guaranteed promise to us is to simply believe it and receive it, right? Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. God made this awesome promise to him that just seemed absolutely astronomical. I mean, he kind of even uses astronomical language, right? He says, your, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And at this point, Abraham is old. His wife, Sarah, is barren. They haven't had their own child yet. And it just seems impossible. But God promised him that he would do that. And it says that Abraham simply believed in the promise. He simply received that promise. He said he, he was convinced, Paul says in Romans 4, that God was able to do what he had promised. He was confident that God would be faithful to his promise. So if God takes the oath, it's a promise covenant, and man's response is simply to believe. On the other hand, if man is the one that takes the oath, then it's a law covenant. And this is what we see uh, in the Mosaic Covenant, where there are blessings and curses contingent upon obedience or disobedience. Blessings for Israel if they obey, curses for Israel if they disobey and if they break the covenant. So there are these two broad categories of covenants in the Bible, promise covenants and law covenants, and the distinguishing factor is who is the one taking the oath? If it's God taking the oath and swearing by himself, then it's guaranteed blessing. If it's man taking the oath, entering into the oath and the covenant, or the oath and the curse, as it says in Deuteronomy 29, then it is a law covenant. And of course, you can already hear that this is sort of the biblical, theological, and covenantal basis for a very important principle in Reformed theology, which is the law-gospel distinction. You can see where it comes from right here. It comes from this idea of these two types of covenants. The law is, it says, you must do these things in order to receive the blessing. And if you don't do them, you're under a curse. As Paul says in Galatians 3.10, cursed is the one who does not continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy when he says that. Deuteronomy 27. But the gospel is a promise covenant. The gospel is God saying, I will bless you based on my grace, and all you need to do is to receive 
the blessing by faith. So right away you see how covenant theology is really helpful for illuminating the gospel and even it affects our understanding of the Christian life. Like how should we live the Christian life? Are we under a law covenant or are we under a promise covenant as Christians in the new covenant? This is all gonna be developed later on in, in lectures to come, but you can already kind of see where we're gonna go with that. So we've seen that a covenant is an oath-bound commitment. We've seen the two major types of covenants depending on who it is that takes the oath. But let's also just sort of step back and be reminded of how important covenants are in Scripture, and in particular, the covenant of grace, God's covenant relationship with his people. It's a covenant of grace. It's a covenant relationship. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 25. It's so interesting to read in the Psalms about the people of God and how they view their relationship with God. The Psalms are the practical expression of the piety and religious life of the people of God. And you see this idea of this covenant of grace and this relationship between God and his people in Psalm 25, verse, uh, we'll start at verse 11 and read down to verse 14. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Don't we see right there this idea of having a, a relationship with God that is a relationship like a friendship? Uh, Another example of an individual covenant just between two people, two individuals, we saw the one between Abraham and Abimelech, but there's also one between David and his friend Jonathan. They made a covenant with each other. It was a covenant of friendship, right? And so that becomes kind of a model, an illustration of the covenant of grace. And this passage right here in, in, in Psalm 25 uh, speaks about the covenant of grace as a friendship covenant that we have with the Lord. Another analogy that's used is the analogy of marriage. Marriage is a covenant relationship, isn't it? Uh, Malachi 2.14, that passage, that famous passage about how God hates divorce, but in there it says, you have forsaken the wife of your wife by covenant. So the idea of a marriage is another illustration of this friendship covenant, this relationship that we have with God. And so, of course, broadening that from the micro level of a man and a wife being married together and having that covenant relationship, we can broaden that to the bigger theological level and talk about the Lord's relationship with his people. He is the bridegroom and his people are his bride. We see that all throughout the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament, too, between Christ and the church. Covenant relationships are established by covenants and are governed by covenants. There's a, um, a common, um, it's almost like a refrain, you know, like in a hymn where you have the refrain that you repeat. There's a common refrain that's found throughout the Old Testament that solidifies this idea of the covenant of grace being a relationship between God and his people. It's, I will be your God and you shall be my people. That is the promise of the covenant. Leviticus 26, verse 12, is one example of that, but it's found throughout the Old Testament. Now, we have to be careful and recognize that not all covenants are like this, right? Um, the covenant with Noah after the flood, it doesn't have this idea of this warm, intimate, marriage-like relationship between God and his people. The covenant with the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah after the flood, is made with all mankind and even the, the uh, creation itself. And it doesn't create a special bond between God and his people because it's for both believers and unbelievers alike. 
So not all covenants have this character to them, but the prominent biblical theological covenants, the covenant of grace, has this character, this quality of a friendship or a marriage relationship, this bond between God and his people. Ultimately, if you really want to think about what is covenant theology all about, we can get kind of technical sometimes and get into the weeds about all the different types of covenants and how covenants are transacted and all the different biblical covenants. But if you really want to step back and just kind of simplify everything, why is covenant theology so wonderful and glorious and encouraging and meaningful to us as Christians? Because ultimately it's all about Christ. That's what the covenant is all about. Christ is the substance of the covenant of grace. And Christ is in that marriage relationship with his people. He is our God and we are his people. It is uh, a part of the, the life of the people of God. That's why I'm planning in these lectures to, uh, you know, when we get to the, the last three, to really talk about the practical outworking of covenant theology, how it affects our understanding of the gospel and the work of Christ and what Christ has done for us, how it affects the Christian life, how we are in a covenant relationship with God through Christ, the mediator of the covenant, and how it also affects our understanding of the sacraments, which are the means of grace by which that, co that covenant bond is cemented and made more real and given these visible signs and seals that, that establish our covenant relationship with God and give us assurance of it. So covenant theology is ultimately about Christ. That's what Jesus himself said. Remember in the road to Emmaus, he said to the disciples, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he um, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We see the prominence of covenant theology in the New Testament as well. Just step back. It's called the New Testament. It's called the New Covenant. What is the New Testament all about? It's about what Christ has done. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us about the coming of the Messiah and about the new covenant that he established through his person and work. The climax of the narrative of the Gospels, the Gospels are passion narratives with extended introductions, and when you get to the climax of the passion narratives, you have the Last Supper. What does Jesus say at the Last Supper? This cup is, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Luke 22, verse 20. Right at the climax of the story, as he's about to go to the cross, he's saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to the cross in order to establish a new covenant. And of course, in saying that, Jesus himself is alluding to the prophecy of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. And so the New Testament itself is a covenantal book. It's all about the coming of the covenant mediator, about his life, his miracles, his ministry, his teachings, how he goes to the cross, and through his blood, he uh, ratifies and establishes this covenant, taking the oath, making that covenant with his people, and then giving us the results of that, giving us the blessings, which is what? The forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the Holy Spirit, all the things that he has secured for us through his obedience to the point of death. So the prominence of this covenant idea is, it just really stands out when you really step back and look at everything that the New Testament is talking about. The Apostle Paul talks about this a lot as well. He has two major uh, sections in his letters where he deals with this issue of covenant theology. One is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where he is saying that we are part of a new covenant, that God has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, and he contrasts that new covenant with the old covenant. The second major passage in Paul that deals with covenant theology is in Galatians chapter 3, where he talks about the law, which came 430 years after the promise that God made to Abraham. Um, in a way, you could almost say he's, he's using the same distinction that, that um, we were talking about before, about those two different types of covenants. He refers to the law, that's the Mosaic covenant, that's a law covenant, and then he refers to the promise, that is the Abrahamic covenant, which is a promise covenant. He even says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 24, that there's an interesting allegory where these two women, 
Sarah and Hagar are allegories for two covenants. These women stand for two covenants. The covenant that genders to bondage and the covenant of liberty in Christ. So we have Jesus himself emphasizing the new covenant. We have Paul making some very important theological teaching about the new covenant in 2 Corinthians and about the law and the promise in Galatians. Then there's the letter to the Hebrews. Just think about Hebrews. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, right in the center of that letter, is an extended exposition of Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. And the author of Hebrews goes through that passage point by point and draws out all the significance of it and explains how Christ is the mediator of the new covenant and how we are under a better covenant than the old covenant. He talks about the blood of the eternal covenant that is the blood of Christ. So covenant theology is not only found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament uses covenant terminology all the time, talking about these oaths and covenants that are made with Abraham and Moses and so on. But the New Testament is also very strongly focused on covenant theology. And of course, this is why the early church had a rudimentary covenant theology. If you look at the apostolic fathers, those are the, uh, the earliest church fathers who wrote after the apostles in like the early second century, uh, the apostolic fathers, they had a rudimentary covenant theology. You can read, for example, the Epistle of Barnabas written around the year 130. And you know, there's some kind of wonky things in that letter. He has some weird ideas about how to interpret the different types and shadows of the Old Testament. Um, one weird example that just pops into my mind was, you know that passage in Genesis chapter 14 where um, there are these kings that come and they take Lot and his family into captivity and then Abraham raises an, an army of his own to go and chase him down and to rescue Lot. Remember that whole passage? Well, it says in there that he took, Abraham took 318 of his own servants and so Barnabas, in this epistle of Barnabas around the year 130, it's not inspired, it's right after the time of the apostles, he does some interesting gematria. Have you heard of gematria? That's, that's where you use uh, Hebrew letters to represent um, numbers. And so it's, it's like numerology. He says that number 318 stands for the letters of Jesus. And so it stands for Jesus. Okay, so there's a stretch, right? He's like, he's pushing things a little bit with his typology and finding things that probably are not authentically there. But he's doing typology. He's reading the Old Testament, reading the, the, the passages and the stories of the Old Testament about Abraham and so on in light of Christ and talking about the new covenant as the fulfillment. Uh, so there's a, there's a rudimentary basic covenant theology even that early. And it's because of these passages that I was just briefly going through in Paul and in the letter to the Hebrews that make very clear, you, you can't avoid it. If you're a Christian, you're reading your Bible, you see that we Christians are part of a new covenant, but that new covenant is tied to and related to the covenant that went before, which is called the old covenant. And so you necessarily have to ask yourself, how do we relate to that old covenant? How do we as Christians relate to what God was doing with the Jews in the Old Covenant? And so there's the beginnings of this basic, simple, sometimes a little bit off, but overall getting the right idea of seeing the connection between the Old and the New Covenants, the Old and the New Testaments. Justin Martyr, also in the middle of the second century, wrote a dialogue with Trypho the Jew in which he explains uh, the Old Testament explains circumcision and the Sabbath and so on in, in Christological terms and connects it all to this basic overarching issue of the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New. It's not just simply that the New Covenant utterly replaces everything in the Old Covenant. There's continuity. There's types and shadows. Um, and yet it's a New Covenant. It's not just simply the Old Covenant. Irenaeus, in his book Against Heresies, also in the second century, but later on in the second century, around the year 180 or so, uh, he also has a very detailed treatment of this whole issue of the Old and the New Covenants. Uh, 
probably the clearest church father who really delves into this is Augustine. He very carefully explains the harmony and the differences between the old and the new covenants. Now, did they have it all worked out the way we as Reformed covenant theologians do with understanding the covenant of works and the covenant of redemption? No, they didn't have all that figured out yet. But they had the basic elements of covenant theology, uh, which is unavoidable if you're just reading the New Testament, if you're reading those passages in, in Galatians or in Hebrews. You can't, get, you can't get past it. It's right there on the surface of the text. During the Middle Ages, covenant theology was always there in the background because it's right there in the Bible. And so even the medieval theologians had to recognize it and deal with it. But it didn't become a overarching paradigm for understanding the Bible because during the Middle Ages, the emphasis was on the sacraments of the church and having this very high view of the church as being the institution through which God's grace flows. And so the covenants were somewhat submerged during the Middle Ages. When we come to the time of the Reformation, though, covenant theology is reborn. And it begins in the early 1500s. Reformed covenant theology begins in the year 1525. Wow, how can we be so precise about that? Well, it's because in the year 1525, uh, Zwingli, was having a public discussion on the topic of infant baptism in the city of Zurich. At this time, the Swiss uh, cantons or Swiss cities like Zurich were all having these debates among themselves and the city council was trying to decide, are we gonna go with the Roman Catholic Church or are we gonna go with the Reformation? But another group also came up at that time in addition to the Reformation, there were these people called the Anabaptists who were, um, wanting even more reform than what the reformers were asking for. Uh, they viewed the Old Testament saints as having an earthly, carnal religion. They viewed the Jews in the Old Testament as just being, the, all they were interested in was just land and kids. <laughs> this is very earthly and carnal, totally different from our piety and our relationship with God. And so they believed that children should not be included in the church. Uh, they believed that baptism and church membership was only for adults upon making a profession of faith. And so Zwingli, having this public discussion on the topic with the Anabaptists in the year 1525, uh, he was the first one to really articulate this idea of the continuity of the covenant of grace and as, as the argument for the inclusion of children in the church. He said that the children born of believing parents are children of God like those who were born under the Old Testament and consequently may receive baptism. He also said that baptism under the New Testament is what circumcision was under the Old. Consequently, baptism ought now to be administered to children as circumcision was formerly. So that was the year 1525 when the city council of Zurich was listening to both sides, listening to Zwingli and the, and the Reformation view listening to the Anabaptists and their more radical Reformation view, and the Church of Zurich, or the City Council of Zurich, decided to go with Zwingli's view. And from that point on, Reformed theology has always had a strong emphasis on covenant theology. One of Zwingli's successors, a colleague and then successor, was Heinrich Bullinger, or Bullinger. Uh, he wrote in the year 1534, the first treatise on covenant theology from the Reformed perspective. The title of it was Concerning the One and Eternal Testament or Covenant of God. Testament or Covenant, interchangeable terms. Concerning the One and Eternal Testament or Covenant of God, showing there's this one eternal covenant that begins in the Old Testament and continues into the New. The concern of the Reformers of the Swiss Reformation uh, wasn't just about infant baptism, though. It wasn't just simply like, how can we use covenant theology to defend our practice of baptizing infants? It was a much bigger issue. It was a broader uh, hermeneutical question, meaning how do we interpret the Bible? How do we interpret the Old Testament? How do we see 
the Old Testament believers. When we're reading the Bible, we're reading all the stories about, Gen about uh, Abraham and Joseph and uh, David and all these great heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. Are we reading about uh, people who only cared about land and kids? You know, are we just thinking, are we just looking at some other religion here and just looking at these guys and all they cared about was having lots of flocks and lots of herds and <laughs> is, that, is that all they were concerned about? No. The New Testament makes clear that Abraham and all these great saints had the same faith that we did. Now their faith was looking forward to the Messiah to come, but they had the same faith, the same piety, the same religion that we had. And so the concern of the reformers and the, the reformed approach to covenant theology and seeing the continuity between the old and the new covenant was not only simply this issue of baptism and how do we argue that, it was this bigger question of maintaining the continuity of religious faith and piety between ourselves and the Old Testament saints so that when we read those stories, we can read them as examples of faith. Isn't that exactly what Paul says in Romans 4? After establishing that we're justified by faith alone, then he says, well, what is faith? And he says, well, let's look at Abraham, because Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So he uses Abraham's faith as the paradigm for what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be saved by faith alone. Uh, same thing in Hebrews 11. Remember Hebrews 11, that whole hall of faith. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, Abel, by faith, Moses, by faith, all the patriarchs did this and that because they were looking ahead to a heavenly reward. They weren't just simply concerned about earthly pleasure and earthly temporal benefits in this life. They were looking ahead to a heavenly inheritance and a heavenly reward. Calvin, in his Institutes, has a whole section devoted to this question of what is the relationship between the Old and the New Testaments? It's, uh, you know, how the Institutes has four books, one, two, three, four. Book two is the book where he deals with this. It's in chapter 10, book two, chapter 10. And the title of that chapter is The Resemblance Between the Old Testament and the New. And this is like a, um, it's almost like a commonplace, meaning a, a well-known topic of theology. Augustine even has passages in his writings where he does the same thing. What is the harmony between the Old and the New Covenant? And what are the differences between the Old and the New Covenant? It's just a topic or a commonplace, and theologians from Augustine on have had to deal with that. So this is Calvin's. Listen to what he says. All whom, from the beginning of the world, God adopted as his peculiar people were taken into covenant with him on the same conditions and under the same bond of doctrine as ourselves. The fathers, meaning the Old Testament believers like Abraham and so on, the fathers were partakers with us in the same inheritance and hoped for a common salvation through the grace of the same mediator. This discussion has been rendered necessary by that monstrous miscreant, Servetus. Remember Servetus? He was the one that later on everybody knows the story of Servetus, how the city council of Geneva burned him at the stake because he denied the Trinity. Well, people don't also know that he also was an Anabaptist in a sense. He had the same view of the Anabaptists that the Old Testament believers were uh, only interested in temporal benefits. And so he says, this discussion has been rendered necessary by that monstrous miscreant Servetus and some madmen of the sect of the Anabaptists Trust me, we're not saying that all Baptists are madmen, but back then they were called the Anabaptists and they had some pretty extreme views. Some madmen of the sect of the Anabaptists who think of the people of Israel just as they would do of some herd of swine. Absurdly imagining that the Lord gorged them with temporal blessings here and gave them no hope of a blessed immortality. Let us guard pious minds against this pestilential error. <laughs> and how can you avoid it? I mean, it's right there in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 makes it absolutely clear, right? That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were looking for a city that had foundations. They were looking for a heavenly inheritance. If they were looking for an earthly inheritance, they could have gone back to their homeland, right? But they knew there was something greater that the Lord was preparing for them. 
And so their faith, their piety, their relationship with God, their covenant that they were under was a covenant of grace just like ours. Yes, there are differences between the type and the shadow, between the promise and the fulfillment, between the earthly benefits, which are a picture of the heavenly benefits. There are all kinds of differences, differences in the law, the ceremonial law, all these things. But underlying the fundamental unity of faith is the same. So that's why covenant theology is so important for Reformed theology, because it not only helps us to understand how we should practice the sacraments, but even more importantly, how we should read the Bible and how we should see the Bible as being one story that's giving us one promise leading to Christ. Okay, I think that's a good place for us to pause for some questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? If you have a question, just raise your hand and speak, speak loudly and we'll get it. Sure, yeah, that's good. An Anabaptist, it comes from the Greek word ana, which means again or re, and then Baptist. So an Anabaptist is somebody who back in that time in the early 1500s uh, didn't agree with the reformers, the mainstream reformers like Luther and Calvin and so on and Zwingli, who believed that the baptism that all the people who were becoming reformed and becoming Protestants that the baptism that they had received as Roman Catholics when they were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church as children, uh, the Anabaptists didn't believe that that baptism was valid. And so they believed if you were becoming a Protestant now, you had to get rebaptized. And so they called them Anabaptists, rebaptizers. So, but there was a whole lot to it. And the Anabaptist movement was. Uh, similar to what we would consider to be modern-day Baptists in some ways, but we shouldn't equate the two. They were very radical. Um, some of them were even trying to like build their own theocracy. They took over this one city called Munster and made it into this holy city, and a bunch of people died. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy social experiment. Uh, so it was pretty radical. They were really pushing. They were really trying to overthrow the established traditions and um, even civil government. Uh, the Anabaptists would say you couldn't serve in the military, you couldn't be involved in government in any way. They tend to be pacifists. So they were much more radical than modern day Baptists. But they do have in common this one issue that they agreed with what modern Baptists would say, which is that uh, baptism is only for those who make a profession of faith as an adult or a young adult, somebody who is consciously making their own profession of faith. The believer's yeah, believer's baptism. Yeah. I forgot to repeat your question, but I wanted to do that for the recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the question was just, what is an Anabaptist? <laughs> yeah, so it was a, a radical movement in the time of the Reformation in the 1500s. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Ryan. So the question is, where does Coxeus fall in the development of Reformed, theology, Reformed Covenant theology? So he was um, Johannes Coxeus, or Coxeus, uh, wrote a book called The Doctrine of the Covenant and Testament of God in the year 1648. So he would belong to the 17th century. So the Reformation begins in the 16th century begins in the early 1500s, Luther 1517 with the 95 Theses, the stuff that was going on down in Switzerland in the Swiss Reformation with Zwingli, that was happening in the 1520s. Uh, then Calvin comes along, second generation of reformers in the 1540s and following. Uh, but then when you get into the 17th century, the 1600s, um, covenant theology begins to become more systematized and uh, this guy, Coxeus, was one of those who helped to systematize things a little bit more. Um, and there were some others as well in the 17th century, like Herman Witsius, who wrote a book called The Economy of Covenants Between God and Man, Comprehending a Complete Body of Divinity. That was in the year 1677. 
That's an interesting subtitle, huh? How he says, he's saying, I'm doing a book on covenant theology, but it's so comprehensive that in a way it's like a complete body of divinity. It's like doing a systematic theology. So covenant theology is becoming more systematized now and uh, you're developing beyond simply the covenant of grace and the unity of the old and the new to these other covenants that are called theological covenants, the covenant of works with Adam in the garden and the covenant of redemption, the one I referred to before that's sometimes called the pactum salutis. So those theologians like Coxeus and Witsius, they were developing things to make it more systematic and adding those additional covenants. And that's a good question. Coxeus is interesting though. He has, some, he has some unique views that most reformed covenant theologians today would say are a little bit off. <laughs> but he was very interesting. He was a very good uh, exegete. He really wrestled with all the texts in Greek and Hebrew. And, but he, he had some creative ideas that didn't really become established as orthodox. So, Other questions? Yes. Do progressive dispensationalists hold to some form of covenant theology? Um, I think that anyone who is a Christian who has a Bible and who's trying to understand the Bible has to talk about covenants. Uh, even um, traditional classical dispensationalists had to deal with certain covenants, like what do you do with the, the new covenant, for example? <laughs> what is that covenant? Um, and so they all have some kind of covenant theology, some kind of understanding of covenants. But it's different from covenant theology because the covenants are not the overarching organizing principle for understanding the entire Bible. They are just simply exegetical issues that they have to deal with. Like they have to deal with that passage there that talks about the new covenant, so what do we do with it? But they don't use covenants as the overarching um, paradigm to understand the Bible. So, I mean, even, you know, it's interesting too, if you look at other traditions like Roman Catholicism or Lutheranism, they all have some version of covenant theology. They all have to deal with these passages that talk about covenants. So it's just a question of how do we organize them? How do we see them as being related to each other? And so the reformed version of covenant theology is unique. Um, in that it emphasizes this idea. So going back to what I was saying before about those three theological covenants, if you don't come back for the rest of this uh, series of lectures, just think about this one thing. What is covenant theology and the reformed understanding of it? It's basically these three covenants. The covenant of works with Adam in the garden. After that, after that covenant is broken because of Adam's sin, because of the fall, uh, God promises to send the Messiah and that is the covenant of redemption, which is a covenant within the Trinity, planning the plan of redemption and uh, sending the Messiah to come and to be the second Adam. Now, I just said after, of course, technically it was before because this is all in the mind of God in eternity past, but in terms of how it's revealed in history, uh, the covenant of redemption is after the covenant of works because the covenant of works has been broken and now we need a mediator to come and fulfill the covenant of works for us in our place, Christ the second Adam. So the first covenant is the covenant of works with Adam in the garden. The second covenant is the covenant of redemption, which is also a covenant of works, but it's, with, it's a covenant of works with Christ as the second Adam. And then he obeys by his active and passive obedience and achieves the blessings of the covenant for us. And then the third covenant is the covenant of grace, which is the historical unfolding of the benefits of the covenant of redemption beginning in the Old Testament in type and shadow and then fulfilled in the New Testament with the coming of Christ in history. The covenant of grace was the first covenant that covenant theology when it began with, with Zwingli was focusing on because of that debate with the Anabaptists. They wanted to say, no, there's only one covenant of grace including Abraham and us as Christians. And so the covenant of grace was the primary place where all the emphasis was placed because of the polemical context of dealing with the Anabaptists. 
But then as time progressed, Reformed theology began to systematize it and say, wait a minute, there's also a covenant of works before the covenant of grace. And then there's also this other covenant between the Father and the Son with Christ as the second Adam. Um, now there were some debates within Reformed theologians over whether or not we really needed to make that a separate covenant from the covenant of grace. Could we just combine that with the covenant of grace? Covenant of redemption and covenant of grace just being one covenant. Some have tried to make that argument, but that's a minority view within Reformed theology. And those who hold to that view are orthodox and we don't view them as heretics. But uh, the majority of Reformed theologians have said, no, we need to distinguish those two uh, because the reason we do is because the covenant of redemption is only for the elect, whereas the covenant of grace includes more than the elect. It includes professing believers and their children. So that's one of the reasons why we distinguish those two. But that's kind of an, a minor intramural discussion within Reformed theologians, a minority and a majority view. The main thing, though, is that there are these three covenants. If you don't come back to any other class, just remember these three covenants, the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace. And then, I'll get to you in a second, and then we'll see how all the biblical covenants, like with Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, how they all relate to those other big, big three covenants. So, yes? Yeah, so in Reformed Covenant Theology, good yes, good. Uh, the question was, what is the distinction that I just made between um, believers, professing believers, and the elect? So th in Reformed Covenant Theology, we believe in two concentric circles, that the visible church is a big circle that it includes all those who profess faith together with their children and then the smaller circle within that is the elect. So, you know, everyone who professes faith in Christ is not necessarily elect. Jesus said that, right? Matthew 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. There are some who make a false profession of faith. There are some who make a profession of faith, and then later on they apostatize, they fall away, and they reject Christ. So we, in covenant theology, we distinguish between that big circle, which includes everyone who professes faith together with their children, and then the smaller circle within that, which is the elect. And the covenant of grace is related to both of those circles. The covenant of grace has both an external administration that includes everyone who professes faith and their children, but the main point and purpose of the covenant of grace is to save the elect. So the covenant of grace is for the elect, but there are these others who are in the outer band who are temporarily a part of the covenant of grace in its external administration. And, and so. like the grace of grace is then the building of the professing ones? Yes, yes, so grace does... Even though they might not be part of the elect? Yes, so we believe that uh, within... The, so you're getting into the whole question of infant baptism and this is what we're going to deal with in the, the final lecture, lecture 12 on covenant theology and the sacraments. But uh, in Reformed theology, we believe that our children uh, should be treated as members of the covenant of grace and as believers, even though it may not be the case, because we, we cannot read their hearts. So we would treat our children as members of the covenant of grace until and unless they uh, reject Christ and turn out to be uh, outside of the church. But until that happens, we treat them as believers, just like we do with any other professing Christian in the church, like you. I don't know you personally. I don't know if you're truly elect or not. I believe that you are because you profess faith in Christ, but I don't know your heart. You don't have a big E on your forehead. So we, we just tr we treat one another according to the judgment of charity. And then God uses that, especially for our covenant children, God uses that, that positive, affirming, welcoming embrace and raising them as professing believers, encouraging them to pray and to uh, believe in the Lord and teaching the, the truths of the gospel. God uses that to convert those that truly are elect. So, yeah. 
Thank you, Thane, that's very important. <clears throat> he's referring to, just to repeat what he said, he's referring to the covenant promises that God has made to the children of believers, to parents and to their children. Uh, we see that, for example, in Genesis 17, where God makes the promise to Abraham, to you and to your offspring. And so we believe that those promises um, continue today in the new covenant. We see those repeated, for example, in Acts chapter two, uh, in verse 39, where Peter on the day of Pentecost says, the promise is for you and for your children, as many as the Lord our God shall call. All right, we need to move on to the next time. Oh, one more question, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. The word federal has like a covenant connotation. The one that I've heard and just just is in I guess similar in the entire reform circles is tell me if if because it's more popular right now, the sixteen eighty nine federalism, if that has if they kinda hijack that term federalism, if that if that has any if they fall under reform or kind of what the sixteen eighty nine federalists do I guess believe or why there's that center. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're asking about what's like, called? Yeah, like the definition of it, and then if it falls within reform, or if they just took the term federalism and kind of hijacked it. So there's a movement out there called 1689 federalism, which is another way of saying it's a, a Baptist version of covenant theology that's based upon the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And using the word federalism, doesn't have any significance, it just means covenantalism. It's just a synonym for that. So, like I was saying before, there are all kinds of different traditions out there, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, who all have some version of covenant theology, because they all have to deal with the texts that talk about covenants, right? So, that's the Baptist, uh, that's the Reformed Baptist um, version of covenant theology, and they held to some particular nuances about how they interpret the Abrahamic covenant, and how it relates to the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. Um, we'll talk about those as we go in the class, but it's a little bit too much to get into tonight. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I wanna do now in the last, uh, I don't know, 30, 35 minutes is to talk about this issue that I mentioned way back at the beginning, you may, you may remember this, way in the beginning, where I said that we're gonna be looking at this topic of covenant theology from three different perspectives. And I said, one perspective is systematic theology, one is biblical theology, and the other is practical theology. And probably all of you are fine with the idea of practical theology, that makes sense. And probably you've all heard the term systematic theology, that makes sense. But then you're wondering, what is this other one here of biblical theology, so I wanna talk about that in the time that we have remaining. What is biblical theology? And how is that another way of looking at this topic? This is really important. It's important as um, a, it's a methodological issue. In other words, um, how do we approach these things? How do we deal with these topics? Um, covenant theology is, a very interesting field of theology because it straddles both disciplines. It straddles systematic theology and biblical theology. And it actually is sort of the, it's the nexus, it's where those two fields, those two methods of doing theology overlap. In fact, I would even argue that covenant theology, which began, like I said, around 1525, Reformed covenant theology, beginning with Zwingli and then developing through Calvin and so on, Reformed covenant theology was the beginnings of Reformed biblical theology. So we need to talk about this idea. What is biblical theology? Biblical theology uh, is a discipline of uh, theology. There are different disciplines within theology. For example, if you go to a seminary and you look at their departments, they have different departments, right? One department is the um, exegetical theology department. Sometimes they're divided into the Old Testament department and the New Testament department. And those professors who teach in that department are really good at Hebrew and Greek. And they're really good at explaining the Bible very carefully, textually, uh, you know, explaining all the, the passages and looking in detail in the Greek and Hebrew. That's called exegetical theology, doing exegesis, exegeting all the passages. 
Then there's another department called systematic theology. And those are the ones that write the big systematic textbooks, right? You've probably heard of Louis Burkhoff's systematic theology or Mike Horton's big systematic theology. Uh, these, these guys are systematic theologians and they are dealing with theology in a systematic way, going through the different doctrines, right? Like the doctrine of God and the Trinity and the doctrine of man, which is called anthropology and the doctrine of Christ, understanding the two natures of Christ, all that kind of stuff. That's called systematic theology. Um, those, are the, those theologians are the ones that get the big billing. They're, the, they're always the ones that get all the fame. They're the big conference speakers. They're the systematic theologians. Everybody loves them. Uh, there's another group, though, in the departments, and that is the historical theology department. And those are the guys that will tell you all about what I was saying before about Zwingli and Coxeus and Witsius, and they're throwing out all these names of all these theologians, and they're explaining what was Calvin's view on this, and how did it differ from Van Maastricht's view on that, and what about Peter Vermigli, and were they, you know, did they hold to uh, Thomas Aquinas, and to what extent did they agree or disagree with Aquinas? So historical theologians, and uh, those actually are really interesting guys. Uh, I love reading historical theology. It's really fascinating. Church history is so fascinating, but I'm not a historical theologian. If you really start to drill down with me on like that question about Coxeus, at some point I'm going to show you my limitations because I'm not a historical theologian. Uh, and then there's the, the fourth department, which is the practical theology department. Those are the guys that teach about how to preach, worship, apologetics, pastoral ministry, ecclesiology, things like that. Practical theology guys are, they're practical, right? They're giving you like how it all works and how does it all hit the bottom line of the Christian life, okay? That's very important, very important. Um, those are the four main areas in a seminary uh, setup where you have these four main departments and four main types of professors. They each have their own PhDs and different, and different expertise. Biblical theology is a sub-discipline under the first one, exegetical theology. It's a sub-discipline of exegetical theology. Exegetical theology deals with a lot of different issues besides biblical theology. For example, one of the topics they deal with is canonics. That is, how do we know which books of the Bible are canonical? And all the debates, you know, about should uh, the book of Revelation be included in the canon? It was questioned by these people and that, you know, and all the canonical questions about the canon. Another topic of exegetical theology is called introduction, whether it's called Old Testament or New Testament introduction. These are the guys that focus on going book by book through every book of the Bible and saying, when was it written? Who was the author? You know, what is the historical situation behind that book? Um, that's called introduction. Another subdiscipline of exegetical theology is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is how do I interpret the Bible? Should we use the grammatical historical method? Is there a legitimacy to allegory and typology? Uh, how do we understand when the Old Testament is being quoted by the New Testament? All of these different questions are called hermeneutics, which is just a fancy word for how to interpret the Bible. Another discipline within exegetical theology is exegesis, and this would be in the form of commentaries. You know, you have these commentaries on each book of the Bible, a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, commentary on the Gospel of Mark, and they go through verse by verse and give you excruciating detail about every single verse. So that's all under the field of exegetical theology. This, by the way, is what I'm trained in. That's my background. That's what my PhD in is this kind of stuff. New Testament, I was a New Testament scholar when I did my PhD. Within this field, though, there's another sub-discipline under exegetical theology called biblical theology. What is biblical theology? Now, don't get me wrong. That word biblical theology is not being used in the way that we commonly use the word biblical. We commonly use the word biblical to mean that it's correct because it's biblical, right? Like you have a biblical view of baptism or you have a biblical view of the church. That's not what the word biblical means in this phrase, biblical theology. We're not saying the right theology. Biblical theology is the theology that's contained in the Bible. 
the Bible's own theology as it is historically and progressively unfolding from Genesis to Revelation. This idea of biblical theology was first defined clearly by a Reformed theologian named Gerhardus Voss, V-O-S. Uh, Gerhardus Voss was uh, a Dutchman, although he was an immigrant to the U.S., and he was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary uh, beginning in 1892. He was the first professor of biblical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary before it went liberal. Back then, as the old Princeton, they hold, held to inerrancy and all that. He was a professor of biblical theology at Princeton from 1892 to 1932, and he died in 1949. Gerhardus Voss is called the father of Reformed biblical theology. Not because biblical theology started with him, because as I'm arguing, I think that biblical theology actually goes back to covenant theology. So the beginnings of Reformed covenant theology with Zwingli and Calvin and all those guys back in the 1500s, that's the beginning of Reformed biblical theology. But Gerhardus Voss was the first one that really explained that and said, here's this discipline called biblical theology. And he explained that it is a sub-discipline of exegetical theology. It belongs in that department, the exegetical theology department. It's distinct from systematic theology. It's distinct from historical theology. It's distinct from practical theology. And it's focused upon trying to understand the Bible's own theology. He defined biblical theology this way. He had two definitions. A big, long definition with lots of words that's hard to grasp and a short definition that's really easy to grasp. <laughs> I like those definitions better. But I'll give you the long definition first. The long definition is, he called it the exhibition, meaning the setting forth, of the organic progress of supernatural revelation in its historic continuity and multiformity. A lot of words in there, a lot of big words with multisyllabic words, right? So it's the exhibition, it's the showing forth of the organic progress. That word organic is really important. When you think of that word organic, it's not talking about the section of the grocery store that has organic food. <laughs> it means uh, or, as an organism, like a living organism, right? Like your body is an organism and everything in your body is interrelated, right? The nervous system is related to the to the muscle, muscle system and the skeletal system and the immune system and everything is all interconnected. It's an organism. So he's saying, what is biblical theology? It's the discipline, it's the theological discipline that exhibits, that, that shows the organic progress of supernatural revelation in its historic continuity and multiformity. So both the continuity and the discontinuity both the things that stay the same and the things that change. So that's a long definition, lots of words. I'll give you the shorter definition, which maybe your mind can more easily grasp, as mine can. Uh, it is the history of special revelation. That's the nice short definition. It is the history of special revelation. What is special revelation? Well, it's the same as what he had said in the long definition, supernatural revelation. It's basically the Bible, right? That's what supernatural or special revelation is, as distinct from, what's the other category? You guys all know this one, right? General or natural revelation, God's revelation of himself in creation, right? Or in our own conscience. Paul talks about that in Romans 1. I see, I see the high school kids are smiling because they know that one. That's great. So as distinct from that, as distinct from uh, natural or general revelation, we have special revelation, which, was, which is God's revelation to us through his word. It is his special revelation, and it is enshrined in the Bible itself. But notice the key aspect of this definition. It's the history of that. That's the thing that makes this definition so interesting. Biblical theology is not the same thing as systematic theology, because systematic theology is just looking at all that we know about God and man and salvation just in the absolute general truth of it, right? But there's no sense of history involved there. There's no sense of like progress and moving from old to new and from the early to the later. It's just the final product. 
You know, now that we look at everything the Bible has to say about God, here's what we can say. All the attributes of God, God's a trinity, all these things, right? That's systematic theology, looking at all the topics of scripture in a systematic way. But biblical theology is a historical discipline that is tracing the history of special revelation. We need to clarify this, this uh, definition. We need to clarify both, both terms, both the word history and the word special revelation, or the phrase special revelation. Let's look at that phrase special revelation first. Special revelation isn't just God's words. You know, God came to Abraham and said, I am the Lord your God, walk before me and be perfect. It's not just God's words, it's also God's deeds. It's what God is doing in history. It includes God's mighty deeds of salvation and judgment. Just think of, what, when you look back in your, on your Old Testament, and you just, with your mind's eye, think about it, there's a lot of words there, but there's also a lot of deeds, a lot of big things happening on the stage of history, right? God is doing things. He's like bringing Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, you know, he's bringing them to Mount Sinai, and God appears in this pillar of fire and cloud on Mount Sinai. Uh, there are theophanies, where God appears in the burning bush and so on. There's the whole motion that happens when they cross over the Jordan River and they go into the land, and then under Joshua, they take up arms and they do the conquest of the land of Canaan. They march around the walls of Jericho. They take possession of the land. They divide the inheritance. Other things happen, there's judgments, acts of judgment where God raises up the nations to judge his people. They, they're sent into captivity in Babylon. There's the miracles of Jesus. Jesus does a lot of teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He teaches them about the gospel. But then he also does things, right? He multiplies the bread and the, and the fish. He walks on the water. He raises the dead. He cleanses the lepers. Those are the deeds of God, the deeds of God through Christ. So special revelation isn't just when God comes and says things to us through his words, it's also when God acts in history. It includes God's mighty deeds of salvation and judgment. And what's interesting is that there's a pattern in the Bible where God will begin with some words to prepare and then he'll do the mighty deeds in fulfillment of what his words were and then after the mighty deeds are done, he'll go back and give some more words to interpret what he just did. So you have mighty words, followed by mighty deeds, followed by more words to interpret the deeds and to give it theological significance. One really uh, obvious example of that is the ministry of Jesus, right? The ministry of Jesus contains both, both words and deeds side by side. He raises the dead, but then he also talks about resurrection life. You see those two all combined together. So even the mighty deeds of Scripture are important to biblical theology. In fact, interestingly, kind of a paradox, but we only know about the deeds through the words <laughs> because it's narrated for us in Scripture. So it's all interconnected together. Scripture does not give us objective reporting. It doesn't just sit there and tell us, okay, then the water went back about you know, 30 feet this way, and then I saw the people walking on, this, on the dry ground. It doesn't just give us the objective reporting as if it was like a camera report recording the event. It also interprets it for us. It tells us what's going on. What is the significance of this? And that's why we need both. We need theologically interpreted history. So special revelation, is God's word and deed revelation. And it's happening progressively throughout history. And this history, as it develops and as it progresses, is creating an organism. It's creating an organic reality that is all interconnected. We don't look at all these separate deeds, all these individual actions of God as just being separate things, as if it's like, oh, there's another miracle, okay, cool, let's go to the next one. No, they're all connected. God is doing something. He is creating something. He's creating his people. He is preparing for the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, he is accomplishing redemption through his work.
So when we use that brief definition of what is biblical theology, we say it's the history of special revelation. You have to have a very deep and robust idea of what that phrase special revelation includes. It includes much more than just simply words on a page. It's the word and deed revelation of God, and it's all organically connected. One way to uh, give you an analogy to understand that is uh, think about, do any of you guys like to um, build Legos? You get those boxes, you know, and it has on the front, it has whatever it is, um, Starship, Enterprise, or whatever it is, and then you open up the, the box and inside are all the different pieces and you have to put them together. Well, you know that there, it comes with an instruction book on how to put it together, and you have to do it in the order that's given. And if you mess up the order, it's going to mess up the result, right? You have to build, like, the foundation, and you add these Legos here, and then it, it builds up, and then it becomes the final product. That's the same way with the history of special revelation. God's word and deed revelation is building like Legos step by step. He comes to Abraham, makes that promise, then he, like, creates the people of God. They go down to Egypt, and he brings them out of Egypt, brings them into the land. He's making covenants along the way. God is doing this in an orderly fashion to create a result that is an org and uh, the whole thing is an organism that is ultimately pointing to Christ. Uh, in a way, you know, that's kind of a profound thought, isn't it? But it's almost as if it is Christ, right? It's like the history of God's word and deed revelation, beginning from Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the gospel, and culminating in the incarnation and the stories in the gospels, it's like an incarnation of Christ ahead of time. Christ is being incarnated into history through his word and deed revelation so that we can know Christ better. And so then when you get to the gospels and you see everything that Jesus is doing, you can interpret that in light of everything that went before. Every story, every miracle, every teaching of Jesus in the Gospels is tied to the Old Testament and is taking all the symbolism of the Old Testament. Like, for example, feeding the 5,000. That's like the manna that Moses gave to Israel in the wilderness, right? So all these things that happen in the Gospels have to be interpreted in light of the organism that went before, the, the pre-incarnation, if you will. <laughs> And then the final incarnation of Christ in, in the fullness and the reality. So the, the definition of biblical theology is that it is the study of the history of special revelation. We just explained what that term special revelation involves. It's a lot more than you think. It's very deep and robust. It has all this stuff in it. Let's look at that word history, though, too. It's the history of special revelation. But when we use that word history, we're not just talking about the study of biblical history in the simplistic sense of, you know, when was the date of the Exodus, and what is the list of all the kings of Israel and Judah. That's kind of like archaeology almost, right? That's not what we're talking about when we talk about biblical theology. That is all important. We need to establish all that, and there's room, you know, to, to study that. You can buy whole books called The History of Israel and they just go through very meticulously <laughs> through every little king and every little event. Uh, but when we're doing biblical theology, it's more than just telling you the story of the history of what happened. It is a theological process. It's a theological study that we're doing. Biblical, theo biblical theology is a theological discipline, not merely the study of biblical history. The focus in doing biblical theology as a method of doing theology is on discerning the theological organism of God's revelation in history. And it takes a little bit of effort because you have to discern it. You have to understand it. You have to read these stories and, and try to figure out what is going on. What is God doing? And make connections with other things. And look at how the New Testament comments upon it. Biblical theology is focused on seeing theological relationships and theological connections. For example, you know, going back to uh, the topic that many of you are so interested in, baptism, uh, setting aside the whole question of infant baptism, just think about what is baptism? What is the symbolism there? 
the Bible tells us that it has something to do with judgment, right? Peter tells us that it's similar to the flood, when Noah's ark went through the flood, but then it was the, the people who were in the ark were saved through the flood. They were saved through judgment. So the water is a symbol of judgment. And then that ties in with all the other water events in the Old Testament, like crossing the Red Sea, right? So you look at biblical theology is looking at these symbols and making theological connections between things and seeing how the organic progress of God's word and deed revelation in history is all united together. So, as I said, this class is going to be focusing on studying the topic of covenant theology from three different perspectives. The first perspective that we're going to start with beginning next week is to look at those three theological covenants, the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace. They're theological covenants because they arise from the process of doing biblical theology and then from biblical theology doing systematic theology and constructing these covenants. There's no one verse anywhere in the Bible that says there was a covenant of redemption. Just like there's no one verse in the Bible that says that God is a trinity. But there's lots of passages and biblical theological evidence that can be collected together and discerned so that we can construct this theological concept of the covenant of redemption. Then after we look at those three covenants, we're going to look at them in order, covenant of works, covenant of redemption, covenant of grace. And then after that, then we will look at the post-fall biblical covenants, the covenants that are actually narrated in history. And they're basically all in the Old Testament, mostly in the book of Genesis and Exodus. But you have the Noahic covenant with Noah after the flood in Genesis 9. It explicitly says God's making a covenant there. You have the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15. You have the covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, sometimes called the Mosaic covenant because Moses was the mediator of that covenant. It's expressly called a covenant in Genesis 19 and also again in Genesis 20, 24. Then there's the Davidic covenant, which is mentioned in 2 Samuel 7. Although, interestingly, that's an interesting one because it's not called a covenant at that moment. In 2 Samuel 7, when God makes the covenant with David, it's not actually called a covenant there. It is called a covenant later, but at that moment, it's not called a covenant, unlike those other ones, Noahic, Abrahamic, and Mosaic, where it, it just directly says God made a covenant right there. Uh, the reason why that's important is because it shows the legitimacy of calling things covenants that are not directly called covenants at the moment that they're made. For example, the covenant with Adam before the fall. The covenant with Adam is not called a covenant, but later on, the Bible does refer to it as a covenant. And then the new covenant. So those are the biblical covenants, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and new covenant. That's where we're going to be dealing with biblical theology. And when we go through those biblical covenants that are expressly called covenants in the Bible, we're going to see how do they relate to, how do they contribute to the systematic big three theological covenants. We're moving then from exegesis to biblical theology, and then from biblical theology to systematic theology. We're moving from the history of special revelation to the systematic formulation of fundamental doctrine. Some people question whether that's a legitimate thing to do, uh, although they shouldn't because we know we have to do that for other doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity, right? But one reason why we can see that it is legitimate to do this is because the Bible itself does it. The Bible itself will do this process of, after narrating individual micro-covenants, will then step back and combine them together into a bigger overarching covenant. For example, we talked about the Abrahamic covenant. It's transacted in Genesis chapter 15, when God passed between the, the animals that were cut in two, and it said, on that day, God made a covenant with Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 18. But then, what happens after that? Well, there's other renewals of that same covenant. There's the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17. There's the renewal of the covenant with Isaac in Genesis 26. 
Then it's renewed with Jacob. Actually, it's renewed twice with Jacob. Before he goes and uh, serves to get his wives, and then after when he comes back, Genesis 28 and Genesis 35. Both of them happen at Bethel, the house of God. So you might think if you're just, you, if you're just a biblicist, meaning somebody who says, I don't need systematic theology, I don't need biblical theology, all I need is just the text. And just read the text and just say what the text says and add nothing more to it. You might think, well, then there's a bunch of Abrahamic covenants. I think I just told you there were one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> right? Because there's two with Abraham, one with Isaac, and two with Jacob. But the Bible itself, looking back on that whole section of Genesis, beginning in Genesis 12 and stretching all the way through Genesis 35, that whole section of Genesis, the patriarchal narrative, the Bible itself looks back upon that and says it's actually one covenant. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. And God heard their groaning. This is by the time they're down in Egypt and they're groaning under the taskmasters of the pharaohs. God heard their groaning and God remembered his what? His five covenants with Abraham? No, his one covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the Bible itself does this. The Bible itself does biblical and systematic theology of taking the micro and then stepping back, getting the big picture, seeing connections, and then combining them together into one theological concept. Psalm 105. Actually, turn to that one. Psalm 105, verses 8 through 11. I love this one. This one is fantastic. Psalm 105, 8 through 11. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. It's even called, not only is it called one covenant, but it's even called an everlasting covenant. And that already is beginning to prepare the way for the idea that maybe the new covenant is also tied to this, and maybe it's all one big covenant of grace. Well, we're jumping ahead of ourselves. We'll get to that later. But you see how there's biblical theology going on within the Bible itself. And the Bible also retroactively applies the label covenant to commitments that were not initially identified as covenants. We saw that with the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, the word covenant does not occur there. But then later on in 2 Samuel 23, verse 5, and other passages, it talks about God's covenant with David. And the same thing with the covenant with Adam in the garden. It's not called a covenant by name in Genesis chapter 2, but later on in Hosea 6, verse 7, it is referred to as a covenant, where it says, like Adam, Israel transgressed the covenant. So the Bible itself does this work of combining things together, stepping back, making a higher level of generalization, engaging in biblical and systematic theology, and that then provides us with justification for what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at covenant theology from a biblical and systematic point of view, looking at the biblical covenants and then stepping back and from that building up to the big three, the big three theological covenants. All right, so that's all I have for tonight. Are there any more questions from this last part about biblical theology? Yes, Alec. When you mentioned the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of grace, yet there's a requirement for circumcision. How does that apply? Come back to lecture number, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> uh, six. <laughs> We'll deal with the Abrahamic covenant in detail in uh, lecture six. So, and also, I didn't mention here in the lecture outline, I didn't mention the Noahic covenant. I will fit that in there somewhere, whether it's in lecture five or six somewhere, we'll, we'll briefly cover that. It is a little bit of a complicated topic, the Noahic covenant, and I want to focus primarily on the big ones, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, and so on. But we do need to mention it briefly. Yes. 
Are you referring to the ancient Near Eastern treaty structure? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. So Meredith Klein, for example, he was influenced by a biblical scholar named George Mendenhall <coughs> in the early part of the 20th century, who, George Mendenhall was an amazing guy. He, he discovered using archeology, span this is totally aside from the Bible, uh, these archeological discoveries of treaties and covenants that were made outside of the Bible, mostly from the region of Asia Minor, the Hittites. And these Hittite treaties uh, or covenants had different parts to them. And uh, Mendenhall and then Klein, using Mendenhall's work, noticed that you can see that same pattern in the biblical covenants too as well. So for example, you have the historical prologue. Well, first you have the preamble where the, the God or the great king will say, this is, who I, this is my name, I am the Lord your God. Then you have a historical prologue that reviews the history of the covenant up to that point. We saw that in Deuteronomy 29 when they're renewing the covenant. That first paragraph there where Moses reminds them of what happened when they came out of Egypt. Then after the historical prologue, you have uh, the stipulations that this is what God requires. Uh, then you have the sanctions, the blessings and the curses, blessings if you obey, curses if you disobey. And then you have the, the, uh, the documentary clause, which is like a curse on somebody who tries to tamper with it. <laughs> if they come and they say, I'm gonna change the terms of this treaty or this covenant, then they're gonna be under a curse for doing that. And you see that as well in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, whoever adds or subtracts, you know. Uh, so that has been a common way of defining covenant. The only problem is that um, scholars nowadays are beginning to question whether that is really uh, the best way of analyzing the biblical covenants. So I personally am kind of shying away from emphasizing that. It also raises the question of, are you using archeology span and extra biblical information to interpret the Bible? And so I think it's best to just, that's an interesting thing and it, it, it does have some value, but I think it's best to just set that aside and just stick to biblical theology and just show all the stuff from biblical teaching you know, Paul in, Rome, in Galatians and Romans makes very clear the distinction between a law, prom, a law covenant and a promise covenant. So that's how I would focus on it. But The question was, are there different elements to a covenant that we see from the ancient Near Eastern cultures? Okay. Yeah. So some of the covenants in the Bible do seem to have that, especially the Mosaic. But there are other covenants that don't, like the Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, so, yeah. And then there's also the question of, like, historical relevance. These covenants were being transacted in Asia Minor, which is way far north, in a completely different culture called the Hittites. Um, is there any, was there any connection between the Israelites and the Hittites? So some people have said, well, if you go down to Egypt, you can find one example of something that sounded similar to the Hittite treaties. And so maybe when they were in Egypt, they got it from there. <laughs> but this is a long, big scholarly discussion that goes on forever and ever. And I just want to like kind of set that aside and not, not bring it up too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that when we talk about the Abrahamic covenant. but. The question was, how do we interpret that ritual when in Genesis 15, when God told Abraham to take the animals, cut them in two, and then make a pathway so that God himself could pass between the pieces? Um, well, not literally God himself, but God in the form of a theophany, a smoking fire pot passes through the pieces. Uh, we don't need extra biblical information to interpret that. We can go right to Jeremiah 34. Jeremiah 34 has the exact same ceremony that happened later on where the leadership of Judah, this is right before the exile, are trying to stave off the exile by making a covenant in which they're promising to do the year of Jubilee where you release the slaves. And they do this, they take a calf, they cut it in two, they pass between the pieces. And it's very clear in Jeremiah 34 that when they did that, they were taking an 
an oath. They were taking a curse upon themselves. They're saying, we're going to do this. We're going to release the slaves. We hadn't been doing it for many years. We broke God's law. We're going to commit ourselves to doing it now. And may we become accursed like this animal that's been cut in two if we fail to do it. Of course, they failed to do it. And then Jeremiah comes and says, remember when you pass between the pieces? Okay, now it's coming. Boom, exile. <laughs> so it's very clear that that's what it symbolizes. So the same symbolism then is we can use that to interpret Genesis 15. Yeah. Sure. The long definition of biblical theology by Gerhard Voss is the exhibition of the organic progress of supernatural revelation. You got that part? In its historic continuity and multiformity. So it's an interesting definition because it, it combines both the continuity and the, the multiformity, both the things that are the same and the things that change. And there's a variety of things going on in the Bible, right? I mean, there's so much that's happening. When you, when you really zero down, if you just take the step back and look at the big systematic perspective, all you need to know is those three big covenants. The first Adam failed, the second Adam comes, and then we have a covenant of grace because of that. But when you get into the weeds of the Bible itself, there's all kinds of stuff going on that's really interesting. And so you, you zero down into that multiformity as well. But you also want to see how it's all connected and how it's all organic. So, yeah. I mean, for somebody that has maybe been raised in the evangelical world or Baptist, and they say, well, why does heaven and theology matter? All I need to do is believe in Jesus and all that stuff is extra. Why would we say that covenant? Yeah. <clears throat> Why is covenant theology so important? Why is it important to the Christian life? Why can't we just say, Jesus died for my sins. That's all I need to know. <laughs> Jesus loves me. Well, in a, in a sense, that's true. That is all you need to know. And, you know, the thief on the cross didn't have a chance to take a class on covenant theology. <laughs> but God did give us a pretty big book here that has a lot of stuff in it. <laughs> and so... If we have the opportunity to study the Bible and we want to grow in our faith and our relationship with God, then we can benefit from that. So I think the answer is that we should study it because God has revealed it and we want to know everything God has revealed. And it tells us more about his grace, tells us more about the work of Christ. It brings out in such a greater way, what is it that Jesus really has done for us? I think when you see the work of Christ in a covenantal context as the second Adam and as the true Israel, it really brings out the Bible, really brings out the gospel, and it's very helpful for our faith to encourage us in the Christian life. Another really critical aspect of it is that it helps us with really understanding how to, how to use the Bible as a means of grace in our personal Bible reading and also as we hear it preached from the pulpit so that when we're looking at any given passage, let's say we're in the story of Joseph or we're in the story, the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, we can see how it fits in the big program of God and then we can properly apply it to ourselves. You know, if you don't understand covenant theology and you just think that the Bible is just one big collection of commandments to do, then what are you going to do when you come to a passage like, go in and kill all the women and the children? <laughs> you know, that's what God commanded the Israelites to do when they went into the land. Is that a commandment? I should just go, okay, I'm going to go do it. <laughs> you know, no, you got to understand that in light of covenant theology, in light of the whole, what is God doing and how does it fit and how does it relate? And it helps us with all kinds of things. It helps us with understanding how to apply the Old Testament laws the civil, the ceremonial, the moral laws. So it's very practical, very helpful. But to me, the most important thing is what I already said. It, it shows us Christ. It brings out who Christ is and what he's done in a way that is so rich and so powerful that if you don't understand Christ's work in covenantal context, you're missing a lot. 
you can still be saved. You're just trusting in Jesus. He died for your sins, but you're missing so much if you don't see it in that whole context. Yes. Is that what they're missing? Yeah. So churches that are very legalistic in nature tend to confuse the law and the gospel. In other words, they don't understand the distinction between law covenants and promise covenants. And so it all just becomes one big law promise covenant. <laughs> and then it puts you back under the law and you start to think that I have to be obedient in order to be blessed. And if I'm not obedient and if not really a good Christian, then I'm under a curse. But if we understand the law gospel distinction or the distinction between the Abrahamic promise and the Mosaic law, then it helps to clarify that the gospel is not just simply a new law. The gospel is that Christ has done it for you. The whole story of the Bible is that Israel failed to keep the law and Christ came in order to keep it for us. <laughs> and he has won the inheritance. He has earned the inheritance for us by his perfect obedience. And that's what covenant theology brings out. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more question. All right. You are dismissed. There are refreshments. <laughs>